Howdy, everybody, and welcome back into another episode of Locked on Aggies, presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. Cole Thompson back in action, talking all things Texas A&M, and today we got to talk about the college football playoffs. Oh my goodness, if you do not think that the game is about ready to change and go on its head, on its access, think again. If you like this and all other SEC talk, make sure you're listening to Locked on SEC with Chris Gordy from Sports Talk 790. Gordy breaks down all 14 teams, including Texas A&M, in all sports, including college baseball, college basketball, and of course, the breaking news coming out of college football. Subscribe on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast listening systems. As always, make sure you're following me on social media, especially all of you over here at Tigna. you got to go ahead and listen. Write their name right down below, at Mr. Cole Thompson. I am the host of the show, and I love public feedback. Anything you can do to make this a more quality-sounding podcast Monday through Friday, give me a follow, give me a shout-out, and I will add it into the mix. Secondly, Locked on Aggies. Locked on Aggies is your number one source for all things 12 Banger related content found here on LOP. You can subscribe on iTunes, listen on the Odyssey app, listen on Spotify, and if you can't do any of that, listen live every single day at LockedOnPodcast.com. College football playoffs. Oh my goodness. I love this conversation more than I love anything else out there when it comes to talking about it. I love it more than some people in my family. Like that's how much I love the college football playoffs because you're wrong. That's why I love it. You're always wrong. And I'm going to be against this for a minute. We'll talk about it, but I'm going to come out and say this. Am I wrong to want this? Am I wrong to hate it? No, I don't think so. Because no matter what, when talking about the college football playoff, you are wrong. 100%. All the time. The college football playoff is expected to expand to 12 teams if passed at the... um, Uh, At whatever meeting they're having, the proposal has been dialed up. And if so, it will be in effect for 2023. That means this will be the final season of four teams going to the college football playoff. And 2023, we'll see a bigger expansion. What does this entail? Well, for starters, all five conference winners would immediately get in. This does not mean regular season conference winners. You have to win the SEC in Atlanta. You have to win the ACC in North Carolina. You have to win the Pac-12 in California. You have to win that final game, and then you're secure. They all get in. Plus, the best winner from a group of five matchups. So the AAC, the Sun Belt Conference, the uh, the Mountain West, the oh God, I'm blanking on it. I'm a few of them. Uh, the MAC. Any one of those who posts post the best record. So like in years past when Western Michigan was really good or in years past where you had Memphis right on the cusp and they went to the, um, the what's it called? They went to the, uh, the, the, the uh, a Peach Bowl. Uh, I mean, the, or, or, uh, the, the Cotton Bowl. And then you had, of course, when Houston upset Florida State, you had all those bowl games. They now will be in the college ball playoff conversation. The other six are at-large bids. So at that point, it is the best six teams in college football. The first round of games will take place on campus sometime during the two-week period after the conference championship game. So here's the other kicker. One through four, the original four, will get a bye. They will not play. They will not play until the college football playoff New Year's Six games. Those games are expected to be played on January 1st or January 2nd if New Year's Eve, fall, New Year's Day falls on a Sunday due to the NFL standards, the semifinals and championship games will be held at a determined date. Semifinals will likely not be a doubleheader. What does that mean? You know how on the day when we usually see the semifinals, you got a game like at three and then a game like at seven and it's college football all day. You don't get off the couch. You literally have a cold, cold case of beer sitting right by your side. That happens now two separate days. Because of the intensity and the inauguration and how much, you know, backstory are going to go into this game are going to merit their own day. That's the other thing. So now we're moving to 12 teams. Every conference winner, one group of five, six other teams would go. How does this play a factor into Texas A&M? Well, it does a lot because of, in my opinion, Texas A&M is one of the biggest winners of this. And I'm going to go through my winners and losers in a second. But you look at the expansion of teams. At some point, the committee is just going to look at the six best teams. They're not going to care about conference schedule. They're not going to care about who won the Pac-12. They're not going to care about who won uh, the Big uh, the uh, the Big Ten when all the other teams of the Big Ten are trash this year. They're going to look at the six best teams on record 
And those six teams that post the best records and best resumes would be in the conversation automatically. They are in, they are here, they're going to stay. That's how it would work. So when you look at it that way, in my opinion, it opens up more doors for other teams. Who are my biggest winners and who are my biggest losers? Number one, biggest winner, the SEC. The SEC has three to four teams every year that you could arguably say, if this was an eight-team playoff, these four would be represented. If this was a 16-team playoff, these five would be represented. If this was a 12-team playoff, these three would be represented. You're going to get that. You're going to see more SEC teams. You're likely going to see the winner of the SEC. That's going to happen. So Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Texas A&M, Florida, the five big names, they're going to go ahead and be in the conversation 100%. But then the runner-up is also going to be in the conversation because if they usually are the way that we think that they are, and Florida and Georgia do a really good job at this, they finish with one loss on the year, two losses total, second loss coming in Atlanta. You can't deny that one loss on the regular season is not going to give them a playoff spot. Another team like AM, they lost by 28 points to te- uh, Alabama in week two. They didn't lose a game since. They're nine and one. They would they were they were eight and one on the year. They had one game canceled in a 10-game college football season. They were eight and one on the year. They finished nine and one with the game win over North Carolina. What are you gonna do? That like like that's a team that has the record. And Florida. Florida had two losses on the year. They had one to uh, 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 Georgia. No, it wasn't Georgia. I'm, I'm blanking on who they lost to. I know Georgia. Yeah, it was Georgia. I'm, I'm like 99% positive it was Georgia. And they lost, uh, they lost to Texas a now. You still have two losses on the year. And with the way that offense was playing, imagine having Trevon Grimes, Kadarius Toney, Kyle Pitts, all in that offense to face off against Oklahoma. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? So in my opinion... The SEC wins. Everyone says, oh, it's so inclusive. I don't want the SEC. Nah. Well, no. The SEC is better. The SEC has been better. The SEC has been a team that consistently is finding themselves four, five, six inside the top 15 year in and year out. And I look at that and I say, okay, that's its deciding factor. Another winner, the group of five schools, mostly the AAC. Consistently, the AAC has been the best conference outside of the Power Five consistently. There was the one year Western Michigan came out of nowhere. They were great. There was one year that Toledo was just blowing people up and it was a fabulous story and they should have gone further and they should have been more in a New Year's Six Bowl game. Outside of that is the AAC. So far, UCF, Houston, uh, Cincinnati, and Memphis have been like the four schools that constantly are finding themselves on the outside looking into the conversation. And a team like Cincinnati, who did finish right outside the conversation. They were undefeated. They literally had a whole segment uh, you know, done by ESPN when the whole college football playoff committee selection was going on. They had somebody in Cincinnati, Ohio, talking about the Bearcats, talking about what they think. They didn't make it, but you know what? In this scenario, they would. Because not only would they have won their conference, they also would have shown by record and by numbers. They had three top 25 wins. Like, I'm sorry, it's three top 25 wins. I don't care that it's SMU and UCF. It Top 25 is top 25. Like, let's get that out of the way. Top 25 is top 25 for a reason. And Cincinnati beat all those teams. They deserve to be in the college football playoff conversation. Team like UCF a few years ago, they claim to win the national title. Well, I claim to think that I am, you know, six feet. I'm not. I claim to think that my dog doesn't love me more than my girlfriend. It's probably not true. You know why? Because if you can claim whatever until you prove it, there's nothing to claim. You were undefeated. Good for you. You know what else happened? Alabama won the national title game that year. And when you look at the conversation that you have right now going ahead, I view this as one that you want to strut your stuff. Go ahead. Post your numbers. Show what you can do. Prove to us that you can hang with the big boys. And at that point, I think that that's why you have the conversation of, yeah, they 100% deserve to win. And they 100% deserve to be in there. Losers. Simple. There's two big losers in this conversation. One is Notre Dame. Notre Dame is a loser. Because at this point now, Notre Dame realizes, holy crap, if we want to be considered for anything, we're either going to have to boost up our strength of schedule, which could hurt our record, or we got to join a conference. 
because of they're going to look at conferences and they're going to look at the six best teams. And in the six best team scenario, a loss for Notre Dame and independent does not bode well in their favor. Huge loss for Notre Dame. They got to join a conference. And I think the more you look at it, you more look at what Notre Dame is going through because of they're not going to have a conference champion. They're never going to be able to finish in the top four. They're never going to be able to be in a team scenario where they are the winners. You're never going to have any of that. So they are 100% out. And the biggest one of all, and the biggest loser in my opinion at least, are the four schools, the top four schools. Because here's why. You want that lead going into the season. You want that lead to show my team is better than your team. No, my team is better than your team. No, my team is better than your team. And then you got to go and play at a neutral site. The top four schools, so five, six, seven, eight in the five through 12 category, do not. They will play at home. They will get one extra home game to set themselves up. So a team like Texas A&M would play at Kyle Field, while a team like Alabama would have to wait to play in New Orleans. We're going to have to wait and play in Pasadena or Phoenix or another one of these schools. That's where they would have to go. And that's where the problem is. It's not really a home field advantage for the schools that have worked hard to get the buy. Instead, they get to go play at a neutral site and maybe, perhaps, win that game. That's what I kind of get. I, I do. It's why I think if you have to go expand, you have to go 16. That way, every team plays. And you all get that first round at home. But that's just not the case. And unfortunately, sometimes that just is the problem. But that is the problem for me. With the college football playoff expanding to 12 teams, you can start making bets on who will be the first 12 to actually make the conversation. But when you do go make those bets, make sure you go to the one place we love and the one place we trust. That's betonline.ag. BetOnline.ag gives you the best buyouts, the best bets, and the best numbers every single day. You follow them on social media at BetOnline underscore AG. Stop seeing on the sidelines and get into the action. When you visit BetOnline.ag, you will receive a 50% welcome bonus with the promo code locked on on your first deposit. BetOnline.ag, your online sportsbooks experts. You know what I really hate? I actually do. I really hate this. I hate doing things that cost me money living in you know the realm I live in today, when I can do it myself, if I just knew where to look. The biggest thing of all is anything car related. My dad has taught me a lot of tricks about how to fix a car, and I love to work on my car. But I have to always go pay an installment fee, a shipping fee, a, uh, you know, you know, a transaction fee, a production fee, all because of I don't know where to get the part myself. Now I do. It's at rockauto.com. RockAuto.com is an online auto parts service system that has been serving customers for the past 20 years. They have everything from engine modules to tail lamps to brake pads to gas brakes. So whatever you're looking for, whether it be to refurbish or call it classic or your daily driver, RockAuto.com has the part for you. They have a very unique, simple catalog where you go on, you look for the model, the year, the color, the mint, and of course, the low, low price. Plus, you can't beat the prices at RockAuto.com. They're always cost affordable and in your favor. Go visit rockauto.com and type in locked on on the how'd you hear about section so they know that we sent you. It's amazing selections, reliably low prices, and all the auto parts you will ever need. Rockauto.com, it's the place to be. Locked on Aggies presented by the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, let's get into the conversation of the 12 teams and how this would fare. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go through the list of how this would have panned out since 2016 because this is the important part is that every year you start seeing teams get a little bit better so in 2016 alabama would have been number one clemson would have been number two washington would have been number three because they would have won the pac 12 and penn state who won the big 10 that year actually would have gotten the bid in the playoff conversation i think it was over oklahoma because they actually statistically had a better record so they would have come in at um number four ohio state with the next best record would have come in at number five Number six would have been Michigan, who came in right below Ohio State. That was the year they were in the uh, Orange Bowl, I want to say. I'm like 99% positive. That was the year. Um, Number eight, yeah, number nine, eight would be Wisconsin. Nine would be USC. Wisconsin would get the bowl game, even though they were right neck and neck with each other. Wisconsin would have gotten the bowl game. Ten was Colorado. Eleven, Florida State. 12 Western Michigan. That was the year with Corey Davis, the year that they went off and row the boat was all its high. So 
The game would have been play played in Wisconsin. The game would have been played in Columbus. The game would have been played in Norman. And the game would have been played in Ann Arbor. That gives an advantage to Michigan, Oklahoma, Ohio State, and Wisconsin, respectively. The winner of Wisconsin would have played uh, Alabama. The winner of Ohio State, so Ohio State, would have played Penn State. The winner of Oklahoma, Colorado, would have played against Clemson. And the winner of Michigan, Florida State, would have played against Washington. These would have been in neutral locations. After that, you would have had one versus four, two versus three, then the finals. That would have been the case. Now, here's the kicker. I said that one team from the non-Power 5 would get it. That's true. I never said they get a higher seed because that's where this comes into play for the next one. So Clemson would have been the number one team in 2017. Ohio State, number two. Oklahoma, number three. Uh, no, no, Oklahoma, number two. Georgia, number three. And Ohio State, number four. Because remember, Georgia won, but Alabama had such a good record. They got in over Ohio State that year. It didn't matter. There was two SEC teams. That was the year. The two are second and 26. So that would have happened. Alabama would have gotten the number five seed and they would have played the national champions. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. UCF. They would have gotten in as the last seed that year. That would have been the first non-Power 5 school from the AAC that would have gotten in. Uh, Auburn would have come in at number seven. Number eight would have been Wisconsin. Number nine would have been USC. They would have played Penn State in that epic game that everyone remembers of Sam Darnold. Then you have number 10, Miami. Number 11, Washington returns as, I believe, yeah, they were the winner of the Pac-12, so they would have gotten in. And then, of course, UCF. Penn State, USC would have played the winner. Uh, the winner of that would have played Clemson. Alabama would have played Ohio State. I'm not going to throw UCF in there. We all know what would have happened that year. Auburn or Miami would have played against Oklahoma. And uh, Wisconsin and, was and Washington would have played against Georgia. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but let's just go look at last year because this is where Texas A&M comes involved. Alabama still would have gotten the number one seed. That was a given. Number two seed would have been Clemson. That was a given. Number three seed would have been Ohio State. Here's why. Because the original number three seed was Ohio State, but they did that because they want to set up for an Alabama-Ohio State reunion, and Notre Dame was the number four seed. Notre Dame is not the number four seed because even though they would have been in the ACC last year, they still were the runner-up. They still did not meet the criteria. To meet the criteria, you have to win your conference. So Oklahoma, who did face off against Florida in the Cotton Bowl, would have gotten the nod and would have gotten the bye. After that, you would have had Notre Dame come in as the number five seed, and this is where it gets really fun. There's three non-Power 5 conference schools now in the conversation if you include Notre Dame as an independent. They would have gotten the number five seed. Texas A&M would have gotten the number six seed instead. Texas A&M would have been number six last year instead of number five. So that's a big kicker. They then would then have Florida come in at number seven. Cincinnati would get number eight. You know, again, that's a good deal for Cincinnati because here's why. Cincinnati then would play host in Cincinnati to Georgia. Florida, uh, Iowa State, who came in runner-up as the Big 12, would have played Florida in Gainesville. Indiana, the Fighting Hoosiers, would have made the trip down to College Station. They would have played against Texas A&M. And then, of course, Coastal Carolina, the Chanticleers, a team that everyone knows I had a huge infatuation with, would have played in South Bend, Indiana. Cincinnati, on their home turf, I believe, if they played as well as they did throughout the entire season, how they looked and how they played against Georgia in the, I mean, in the uh, Peach Bowl, I believe Cincinnati would have won. So Cincinnati would have then played Alabama. Notre Dame, Coastal Carolina, I like Grayson McCall. I love Jamie Chadwell. Notre Dame's defense was too damn good last year. I would have 100% said that Notre Dame still wins. I believe that it would be a lot closer. Florida gets by. Flor Florida does get by. I'll give them that. Florida does win. But Iowa State does still show they are the champs. And then Texas A&M would beat Indiana. Without Michael Pence Jr., I don't see a way this team does it. So in the final round, it would have been one, one and eight, four and five, two and seven, three and six. You would have gotten Georgia, I mean, Alabama to face off against Cincinnati. And I think Alabama would win that. Oklahoma would face off against Notre Dame. I think Oklahoma wins that. I think you look at Clemson versus Florida. I think that Clemson wins that. And then the conversation. And this is why it's important. If the college football playoff would have gone the way it should have last year, we would have gotten that answer. Who's the better team? Texas A&M or Ohio State? Who's the better team? 
Texas a and or Ohio State. Both got one loss. I mean, uh, 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 Ohio State doesn't have a loss, but they've only played six games. A&M hasn't lost since week two. Both offenses look good. Both defenses, they're playing lights out. Who's the best? Who is it? Simple. You decide on the gridiron. That would have decided it. And I believe in this situation, Texas A&M would have won. They then would have faced off against Clemson. Uh, Alabama would have faced off against Oklahoma in the final four. I still believe Clemson would have won. I know a lot of people are going to give me crap for that. I don't care. I think that the way Clemson's offense was last year, Clemson would have gotten that win. I think the way Clemson's defense was that year, especially without a true number one wide receiver, Clemson would have won. It would have been by like a field goal, but I think Clemson would have won. Alabama would have beaten Oklahoma. Alabama still wins the national title. That's just my opinion of the situation. I'm not saying it's the right one. What I am saying is I believe that that would be the one to look at going into the season. This episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by Lucy.co. Lucy.co is a nicotine company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers who are trying to find a better way to get the nicotine without all the harsh chemicals. Researched and developed for three years, Lucy.co has created nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three different flavors, including wintergreen, pomegranate, and cinnamon. Plus, you can also have the lozenges that come in cherry ice, citrus, and mint. Lucy lozenges and gums are FCA, HSA eligible, so you can use your FSA card to get them. Plus, they're a lot easier on your breath. They're a lot easier than hurting your body with the chemical smokes. As somebody who used to vape consistently, I know that I never liked the feeling afterwards of vaping. I always just wanted that nicotine high. Now I know where to get it with Lucy.co. It's 2021. Throw the vapes away, get rid of the cigarettes, and go get yourself some Lucy.co gum or lozenges. Go visit Lucy.co, that's L U C Y.co, and use the promo code Locked On College to check out a 15%, uh, 20% discount on all products with your first purchase. Warning Nick, this product does contain nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Lucy.co. Make sure to visit Locked On College. Uh, make sure to let's visit Lucy.co. Use the promo code Locked On College to save 50, uh, 20% off your very first purchase and find a way to get a healthy and more efficient patch for your nicotine fix today. Locked On Aggies presented by the Locked On Podcast Network. Cole Thompson back here. All right. In 25 minutes or less, I can get you caught up on everything you need to know in the sporting realm, whether that be the NBA playoffs, the College World Series, uh, and, and of course, what's going on in the MLB. How do I do so? Simple. You listen to Locked On Today with Peter Bukowski. Peter breaks down all twenty, uh, all teams going into the upcoming season, all major sports, and everything you need to know about what's going on in the world today in 25 minutes or less. Subscribe in the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast listening systems. All right. So now the question is, what would it look like in 2022 based off of preseason rankings? And that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to go on preseason rankings and decide how this would look going into 2022 for setting up the college football playoff. So based off the preseason rankings, and I'm just going to go with ESPN, just going to go with the very first one I see, they have Oklahoma as the number one team. I also think Oklahoma is a little overrated, but I do think that they have probably the best bet to secure the number one seed. So Oklahoma, Spencer Rattler, Lincoln Riley, they get the first seed, they get the bye. They do not have to play in round one. Team number two. No surprise here, it's Alabama. The reigning national champions, they lose some pieces. They also gained a lot. They also have a lot of talent already still on the roster that has, doesn't have, haven't maybe reached their full potential. They come in at number two. Number three, no surprise here. This is one where it is Clemson. Now, based on ESPN's rankings, it shouldn't be Clemson. It should be Georgia. That doesn't work because Georgia would either have to beat Alabama to get that number two seed, or they lose to Alabama and they have to do a play-in game. In this scenario, I'm just going off this. I'm not going off my predictions right now. I'm just going off this. Georgia would now be actually number five. Clemson, who has one of the best defenses, they were placing a generational quarterback, and Trevor Lawrence would move in to the number three spot. And number four would be Ohio State, who actually comes in at number five. So, Ohio State, they're placing Justin Fields, they're placing a few pieces on defense. They still have Ryan Day. They still have a lot of talent on the offensive side of the ball. I do worry about their offensive line. I wonder what they're going to do to replace guys like Josh Myers and Wyatt Davis, but if they can do that. They have a really good running game with Master Teague. Um, I forget the other kid's name right off the top of my head, but they have some talent there. They have a lot to go build with going into the season. So, coming in, based off ESPN's rankings at number five, them would be Georgia. They automatically would host a game in Athens. They would be hosting a game because they were the number five seed. You got JT Daniels, you got a top 10 defense, you got a um, you know an elite 
the uh, pl mastermind play caller and recruiter and Kirby Smart. Makes a lot of sense. Number six in this scenario would be Iowa State. Iowa State got the nod over Texas A&M right now because of what they are returning. They're adding, they're keeping guys like Brees Hall, uh, Charlie Kohler, uh, uh, Brock Purdy. Uh, the defense is pretty good. Matt, Matt Campbell and what he's done in the last few years has completely revitalized this program. They also have wide receiver uh, Xavier Hutchinson and a few other players in the defensive line to where Ames is going to be rocking. So Ames would get the bowl game at the number six seed. Number seven would be Texas A&M. Texas A&M, they're probably going to say, has one loss on the year, maybe two, but right now one to Alabama for sure. Because of that, can't take them out of the conversation. I still believe A&M could be in the Final Four. I definitely believe that in any scenario right now, they would be in the college football playoff conversation as at least a top eight seed, and that's exactly what they're saying. They come in at number seven. Number eight in this scenario is North Carolina. So what everyone's saying is that North Carolina would lose to Clemson in the ACC championship probably have one or two losses on the year, they would come in at number eight. Now, at some point, I have to include a team from the Pac-12. So let's just look at the list real fast. Is there a team listed on here right now that comes with the Pac-12? Good, there is. So I don't have to worry about that. Who would play against North Carolina in Chapel Hill? That'd be Cincinnati. Cincinnati, based off this analogy, would play in Chapel Hill. Desmond Ritter comes back. You know, you still have Ahmad Gar Sauce Gardner. You still have Luke Fickle as your head coach. You still have a lot of good defensive pieces. You got to replace the left tackle and James Hudson. Besides that, that's a team I think that's ready to win now. Coming in at number 10, this would be the team that would face Texas A&M. It would be the Pac-12 winner in Oregon. Mario Cristobal's team, they have one of the best defensive players in the game in Kayvon Thibodeau. Uh, they're trying to make sure that they're still solidified at quarterback. They feel a little bit healthier that they have more guys coming back in. Uh, they added Ty Thompson. You know, they also added um, um, uh, Anthony Brown. I mean, Anthony Brown also left this past offseason. Uh, they have one of the best cornerbacks in the Pac-12 in Michael Wright. They have one of the best outside linebackers in Mace Funa. They're going to be in a really good spot. Who would play in Ames? would be not a far drive, actually. It would be Indiana, based off this analogy. Michael Penix comes back. He's fully healthy. They added in some transfers. They added in some other players. You uh, you lost guys like Wap, uh, Wap Filler, but you kept guys like uh, 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 Fogeltree. Uh, yeah, uh, Fogeltree. Uh, you added guys like Ryder Anderson, James Evans, Zach Carpenter, uh, former A&M player, and Cameron Buckley. To be able to get back in Michael Penix Jr. or even uh, have Jack Tuttle come in and play for a little bit, you really set up. And in this scenario, one more, Georgia would play host to Notre Dame. They still believe that Notre Dame would get the bye because of the situation that would be going on. Notre Dame's legislness, their, you know, the way their schedule sets up, they have to win a ton of games. They have to be really talented because, of, again, let's look at the teams that fall just below uh, them. USC coming in at 13, Iowa coming in at 14, uh, Washington coming in at 15. I know Texas is coming in at 16 or 17. Florida coming in at uh, Florida coming in at 18. Wisconsin coming in at 19. Ole Miss coming in at the top 20. I mean, again, you're looking at these teams. Coastal Carolina coming in at 21. Um, uh, Penn State coming in at 23. Notre Dame has to show right then and there that they get 100% hang it. If that's the case, so be it. But then they would play against Athens. So then the, the way it would be set up would be the winner of Georgia-Notre Dame would face off against Ohio State as the number five seed or the number 12. Um, no, the, yeah, the, no, no, no. The winner, of, uh, uh, yeah, the winner of Ohio State would face off against, yeah, that the, the uh, Ohio State would face off against Georgia-Notre Dame. Number six versus number 11 would be Iowa-Indiana. They would face off against the number three scene. So that would be right now Clemson instead of you know Georgia. The winner of the um uh 10 versus seven seed, so Texas AM versus Oregon would face off against Alabama in the scenario in this scenario. And the winner of the eight versus nine seed would face off against Oklahoma. So that would be either uh North Carolina and Cincinnati. Based on that analogy, I would go Cincinnati gets the win. They would face off against Oklahoma. I would then go Alabama would face off against Texas A&M. They would 100% beat Oregon. After that, I would say uh, Iowa State beats Indiana. So they would face off against Clemson. And then I will still go Georgia beating uh, Notre Dame. They would face off against Ohio State to go into the Elite Eight conversation and when bowl games actually begin. This is a long episode. That's going to do for this edition of Locked on Aggies. Make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson and at Locked on Aggies. We will be back on Monday to discuss all things Texas A&M and the recruiting trail, what we're hearing coming out, and of course, talk about some new hires and new additions to the team. Make sure you're listening.